Thank you very much and good morning conference. It gives me great pleasure to propose this motion. It's a product of a year's work talking to scientists, engineers, medics, social scientists, uh, IT professionals, charities, learned societies and more. And I'd like to thank all of those who contributed and helped for it. Now this motion is a summary of a, a full paper available online at tinyurl.com slash SIPOL and I hope you will all read it for the full details if you haven't already. Britain has a proud history of leading the world in science. Innovations from British researchers have changed our planet and our way of life. From Newton to Keynes, Crick to Berners-Lee, we have changed humanity's fundamental thinking. But we are in danger of losing our reputation as a world leader in research and development. We are in danger of limiting our access to vital technological developments and the benefits they bring. Scientific research in the UK is underfunded. We do not do enough to promote science in schools and our tight immigration controls deter the best researchers from coming to the UK. Now, conference, it's hard to imagine what the UK economy will look like in 2030 or 2050, but we can be sure that scientific and academic enterprise developed now will be at its very core. And this policy paper sets out how we can ensure that research in the UK continues to thrive in the coming years for the benefit of us all. And we and the Liberal Democrats have a proud record in this area. MPs such as Dr Evan Harris and now Lord Phil Willis have built our reputation and The Guardian concluded in 2010 that the Liberal Democrats have set a very high standard with their engagement with the scientific community and their commitment to evidence-based policy informed by advice from independent experts. Praise indeed and well deserved, but we haven't actually published a policy paper on science and research since Margaret Sharp's excellent paper in 1991. And in that last two decades, things have changed. There's been real terms reductions in science funding, increased competition from overseas in scientific innovation and research. So how do we make sure that the UK keeps its reputation as a world leader? There are three main areas, funding, people and what we do with the research. So financial investment from both government and non-government sources is essential if the British economy is to reap the benefits of a thriving research and development sector. And many studies have highlighted the significant returns to our economy from investing in research. For example, the Wellcome Trust, MRC and Academy of Medical Sciences found that every pound invested in medical research generates an ongoing return of 30p every single year. And Jonathan Haskell from Imperial College Business School estimated that cutting the Research Council funding by a billion pounds would cost GDP 10 billion pounds. Yet despite this, the most recent figures show that the UK is spending just 1.85% of GDP on research and development, including both business and government expenditure. This figure plummeted under the last Tory government and stayed flat under Labour. Only Italy among the G7 spent less on R&D. We're below the EU, the OECD averages, the target we set ourselves at Lisbon. We have punched above our weight for a long time. There's only so long that we can sustain our reputation if we continue to underfund. And while I'm pleased that the coalition government didn't give a cash cut in the science, to science funding in the recent spending review, Standing still in cash terms is just not good enough, and the cut in capital funding has hit hard. And for science to flourish, a commitment to the long-term growth of funding is absolutely necessary. This will attract and keep the best researchers and provide them with the support that they need. And for that reason, I am calling for a 15-year commitment to an annual increase in a ring-fence science budget, both revenue and capital, of 3% more than inflation. Now, of course, no single party can guarantee this alone. And I call upon both Labour and the Conservatives to support us on this to make it actually happen. If they really care about the future of this country, I hope they will rise to our challenge. And if government increases its investment, we have to ensure that industry does as well. So we have to encourage more in investment from industry as well as from the charitable sector and from the EU. The government has lots of tools available to promote private sector R&D. Uh, we should support R&D tax credits further, have a quota for civil procurement from SMEs. Increasing the science budget will in itself also help to give private companies the confidence and incentive that they need. And applied research contributes massively to economic growth, but so too can blue skies research. We rarely know where these ideas will lead. But we know that lasers, the internet, monoclonal antibodies contribute massively to our economy and world today in ways that simply couldn't have been imagined when they were being worked on. Blue Sky's work should be supported for its long-term benefits as well as for its own sake. The conference, funding alone is not enough to secure a bright future for research in the UK. 
We have to have people here with the skills and passion to do the work. There are two ways we can approach this. Either we train them here in the UK, or we attract them from overseas. And the UK must act now to improve the development of skilled people from our education system, from better STEM provision in our schools, our decent IT lessons, to greater financial support for graduate students, we have to promote an easier and more efficient route into research. At the end of the last Labour government, the UK school children had slipped to 16th in the global rankings for science education, 28th in maths. maths. That is unacceptable. If we want a stronger economy, STEM teaching has to be at the core of our efforts to enlighten and inspire the next generation. We have to make sure there are teachers in schools with the skills to do that. And postgraduate students, conference, postgraduate students currently have to pay the cost of their own education up front, borrowing the money from family or banks. That's surely the wrong approach. And for those who aren't fortunate enough to get government grants, and some do, they should be offered income contingent loans, so they only pay the cost back when they are earning well and nothing up front. And if we exclude whole swathes of people from entering research, we will do worse as a country. So we must make sure to attract more women and people from poorer socio-economic backgrounds into science and research to ensure that a wealth of talent does not pass unnoticed. And international students who are looking for the best place to study and contribute to the scientific community. Science research is a global collaborative activity. We need to attract these people. We should want international students to come here to study, paying as they go, and we should want the brightest and the best to remain here to work without facing the challenge of extensive bureaucracy in obtaining a visa. Now, there is more, far more conference in the full paper about evidence-informed policymaking rather than a traditional knee-jerk response of the past. We have to make sure that results are made available through open access publishing and open data principles. And we need to make sure that government is held to account when it misuses evidence. Conference, if you believe, like I do, in the importance of ideas, innovation and enterprise as a way back to economic growth and of value to humanity itself, I hope you will support this motion. It contains ideas that I believe this government could start to implement now. If we do take the steps outlined in my policy paper, I believe we will see a truly bright future for science and research in the UK with all the benefits that brings to our country and the world. Thank you.